800 feet, $40,000 bill from that. You're taking a heck of a risk not to have hard data. Drill where the water is, not where you wish it to be. Ding, 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 ding. All throughout in here, you could almost drill anywhere. My name is Mark, my name is Mark, my name is Mark. Water is the most useful resource for building a desert forest. I originally expected not to have access to any water and that this would be 30 years to show you guys any meaningful results. But as I spend more time in Sierra Blanca, new doors open. I built a relationship with my neighbor Bill and he's been very generous letting me use his water well that's been sitting unused for over a decade. Access to a new resource changed the nature of this project. And as thankful as I am to have a well three miles away, hauling water still puts wear and tear on my equipment, like my trailer that broke last week. The ultimate solution is to dig a water well on the Dust Ups Ranch. Duh. That seems so obvious, so why haven't I done that yet? Water wells are extremely expensive, and like anybody, I expect a return on my investment. Here in Red Light Draw, water wells only yield two or three gallons a minute. That's a healthy amount of water for running a household, but I'm not out here to live off grid. I'm here to build a desert forest. If I'm gonna dig a water well, I need a lot more water than two or three gallons a minute. The other problem with wells out here is the depth. The hydrology reports estimating the need to go 400 to 600 feet just to get that two or three gallons a minute. It is wildly expensive. Maybe, just maybe, there's a chance to get significantly more water without having to blindly drill holes. And I know a lot of viewers swear by water dowsing. I'm not opposed to other people dowsing. If that's what you wanna to do to find water, knock yourself out. But there's literally no chance you're gonna convince me to make a $20,000 decision based on a guy twirling some metal sticks. The reason Mark and Ryan are here from Primary Water Technologies is to help me make a data-driven decision. Mark and Ryan completed their initial data collection before I even arrived on the ranch. And as I showed up, Mark sat me down to go over his initial findings. So we take uh, passive seismic readings, which are the resonance acoustic profiling, we'll show you that. And it's a one sensor piezoelectric listening to the natural resonant frequencies coming out of the earth. So we took readings every, I think it was every three paces, three meters, okay, and processed it. Water's gonna flow anywhere, it's gonna follow the path of least resistance even down there. We're looking at these down into the earth and looking for anomalies. The really darkest blues are back up. <laughs> in this area right here. Actually, cut does sweep around a bit through there. And then this hill that I parked next to and went, huh, wonder what that's gonna tell us. This hill is right behind us right here. So line two goes right here, up the ridge and on top of it a bit. It looks like this. Okay, a little more action. It's processed down to 1,300 feet. This is a really good fracture that we can tell wants to come up. This is the kind of deeper water that you can find, but you still have to be directly on top of that. To give us some context, Mark and Ryan also collected some data from the well that I'm using from my neighbor's property that's three miles away. We can use that to compare known data against their survey on the Dust Ups Ranch. All right, and a witcher up here and all the variables involved and a rig comes in to hit these, you're taking a heck of a risk not to have hard data. I'm a novice when it comes to geology, so I don't have an informed opinion on their theory of primary water. What sold me on their service is their track record that's been documented on YouTube by real people. Finding plentiful water is the ultimate goal, but the most consistent feature that they're doing is predicting changes in formations as they're drilling. That's what I find convincing because I can test that from the surface. Drill where the water is, not where you wish it to be. If water's easier to find, you wouldn't use it. People don't want to call us. We go where it's tough to find water, obviously, right? And we have a heck of a good track record. So now we've got our anomaly. We're looking for those fracture zones of the crust. And if that water finds it, it under pressure, it moves up. And if it reaches the surface, we give it a really technical term. Spring! 
Well, where did that spring from? Why do we protect these for eons? We know the high quality. And if you test them geochemically, you know it hasn't touched the atmosphere. So that was the line one up that hill. You could see some flags. Interesting, there's something here. I wonder if we're gonna see it down here. And we're coming on this side of the camp to hit those blow blue gamma zones. Somewhere in here, I went, holy smoke, we just dropped, you know, like I saw an 82, and then it stayed low, right? And then as we process that, and that structure that we see in there is almost from that flag to that flag. It three different points of data saw it. So we said, well, let's get to the middle of it and cross it. Ding, 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 ding. Pretty much right on it. All throughout in here, you could almost drill anywhere. Ultimately, we go back to our gamma ray scintillation counter there. So this is the gamma scanning device that we use. Uh, amazing device. Inside of here is a photomultiplier tube. It's capturing those gamma rays as they come out. And we just start crossing it, crossing it. Ultimately, th that's probably our drill spot. But I may decide with this guy to kind of just say, well, you know, almost anyone there and it's not like it's an issue you can move the you know what you're going to use that anyway if we move it you're going <laughs> to you don't have a problem losing that guy all right he'll be up top there on the terraces 92 right there you see that 92 so water right water's dampening these numbers The my german guy doesn't need to pass the size to look down he builds this he trusts this he, uh, he's used it for decades and believes and he has found thermal waters spring waters and so forth having a productive well anywhere on my 320 acres would be an amazing outcome if i'm fortunate enough to get a well that produces something in excess of 20 gallons a minute and it's right by camp then that's a dream scenario and I really want to emphasize that this project is not about off-grid living. For my family and I, it makes sense to bounce back and forth between the Dust Ups Ranch and our home in Fort Worth. The living situations on Dust Ups for the week that I spend out here every month is the bare minimum standard to make producing a desert forest possible. I live for 25% of my time in a retired laundry room from the oil fields called a drill rig doghouse. Living for a week at a time Every month in 87 square feet, I cannot wrap my mind around people's interest in tiny home living. As you watch these Dust Ups episodes, I'm wearing boots 99% of the time. I'm upgrading my boots thanks to Tacova's, the sponsor of today's episode. There's one thing that makes a Texan happy. It's a new pair of boots. Handmade in Leon, Mexico. I picked the Banderas Ranch boot because I plan to work in these boots. I have a strong opinion on boots. Comfort comes first. Tacovas is known for their broken in leathers, so you don't have to worry about breaking in stiff or uncomfortable boots. The most distinct feature is the heel. I've never felt anything like it in a boot. At first I was worried about my heel rubbing on the back here, but there's something about the way they're made where I can feel my heel lift but clear it at the same time without rubbing, which means that I'm gonna be able to walk a long distance in these ranch boots. And these boots look good. This is by far the best I've ever looked on the ranch. Click on the link in the description or scan the QR code to get your new favorite pair of boots today. Should be good to go, but for now, let's go do some work. You liking it? Oh, Ryan's liking it. So we gave it the, the digital, we even went analog. <laughs> all right. You know, it's old school there. We make Texans happy. All right. We're not against y'all witchers. We're just bringing some data here. Animals do not like these zones. Horses, if you try to pen them up there, you're wondering why they're all, ah, they're, they're all, uh, you know, not happy in the zone. But a cat, cats love to sit in these electrical zones. They can, whatever it is, cats being cats will take these zones. But most animals, camels, uh, in the Middle East, uh, horses, all that, they, they know because they can sense this stuff. And in fact, in the Middle East, the, the men who used to find water didn't use anything. They'd walk barefoot. Hmm. They could feel those zones, interestingly. You know, low tech to find water. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's amazing. Like I say, you can't get away from it because that's still the number way people look at it. If they trust the guy, he has a track record. He's, uh, he's a couple hundred bucks. He's a cheap date compared to me. But we're still a cheap date compared to that drill. Yes, you are. Man. And while I'm deeply skeptical of dowsing, I have a lot of respect for people reading bioindicators as a tool to search for water. Mark talked a lot about Bedouins and people around the world and how they look for water. There's obviously something in our biology that makes us able to find water. My own experience with bees in the desert tells me that this is true. Most of the animals out here have an incredible ability of finding water that isn't visible. 
coyotes, horses, donkeys, they all dig. If they're able to do it, it's not a stretch to think that humans have an innate ability to find water too, even if we don't understand how we're doing it. So that's what we did. Ryan, do you want to take a reading yep. kind of live? So once again, this is uh, called Resonance Acoustic Profiling, or RAP for short. And it's based on resonant frequencies of the earth that are naturally coming out. And we have a piezoelectric sensor. That's not a geophone. It's taken apart and a piezoelectric sensor created inside of it. Basically a listening device inside that pouch to collect the data and a data cord to the laptop to operate the software. You could choose your frequencies. The lowest frequency is 450 hertz. I'd have to wait though like 30 seconds, but then I could collect that data to 2000 meters you know, 5,000, 6,000 feet. I'm concerned that some of you are thinking Ryan tapping the hammer has anything to do with the passive acoustics. That's just a way for him to kickstart the system. It's telling the system it needs to start reading the passive data. He's not using a little hammer to generate sonar. All right, so that's that's it. It's a dance between the wrap and the gamma. And then we'll, we'll walk these lines slowly, put that graph over it see if we're seeing things, you know, the correlation, and uh, back and forth to narrow it down to stake in the ground. Usually on a homestead or project, we're, uh, if it's small, we're there all day, bigger, two days, you know, and uh, we'll get one, usually two, sometimes three stakes in the ground, and then kind of work with them and say, well, we, would, we like this the best, okay, that we like, and it's close to your power, cool, whatever. We follow them all the way through. We want case studies, we want success stories. And again, there's a lot to learn about the drilling side what drillers and we we don't know drillers everywhere obviously but we try to learn who those drillers are when we do the map studies that we did for you we look at those drillers and what equipment they're using and we can start to see who's in the area i mentioned earlier in the episode my confidence in a data-driven approach i can take the little knowledge i do have of geology and extrapolate whether i should feel confident about the information that mark and his company are providing me here's an image of bill's water wells that I'm currently drawing from. I know the yield, it's two to three gallons a minute. And what I want you to notice is how there is almost nothing going on with the colors or the imagery. You don't need to be an expert to understand that it's kind of boring. There's very little going on. If you have a soil where everything's consistently mixed, you wouldn't expect to see very many changes. And that's exactly what you're looking at on the screen. It's boring, nothing's happening. The technical term for the overburden, the stuff in the middle above the bedrock, is called bolson fill. It's a geological grab bag of small pebbles and sand that are all mixed together. Silt, sand, and then there's all types of small rocks from pink quartz to granite to basalt. It's a mix of everything. And the imagery represents changes in density. Now, when we jump over to the imagery of my site, it gets much more interesting. I also have bolson fill, but it's incredibly shallow. You can see the drash tent in the background while Mark sets the stake. And then just 30 or 40 yards away, I took this clip of exposed limestone and you can see that same drash tent in the background. There's solid rock just under our feet and that is one of the key ingredients that Mark's theory depends on to find water. Primary Water Technologies operates on a theory that fractures in the bedrock drive water from deep in the earth. Well, that, those are the things where our data doesn't automatically say water or gas or oil or gold. It's, it's all in multiple data correlation points and then learning an area. So what, you're, what you found is the, the gamma radiation, the, the passive acoustics. Low gamma, passive acoustic structure. The shape. Good shape of that. Looks like good tight structure that's moving. Uh, we're bisecting, it's probably moving in some direction like this down there or here, it could change. And typically that water that we find is potable without need for filtration from the wellhead, bacteria free, slap a spring water label on it. All right, so I'm, I'm going for the stake right here. The desert forest plan keeps changing. Many of the engineers in the audience want to see a defined plan right from the get-go, and then I go speeding off in that direction, making things happen. But I hope this episode demonstrates that I'm still learning the resources at hand. What if I go speeding off in the wrong direction? I'm trying to go fast enough that I can show progress and learn. I've dug the bathtubs, I've made the terraces, I've planted the terraces, but we're not going a million miles an hour. But based on what Mark has shown me, 
I'm not going to make big bets until I think I have enough information to make an intelligent choice. Drilling a well in that particular spot looks like an intelligent choice. It looks like a good return on my investment. That area up there was not as interesting by far as here. This stood out, Gamma, because he walked, 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 walked. And there was a low there and then there was the lows here. Question for you. So I know that that well down there does two to three gallons a minute. Can I extrapolate that this, if I hit water, that it's a lot more than that? I would be shocked if that's given two to three and that lens up there, and we see that lens here. So that's our first test is like, is that lens, which is down around hundred feet. So, you know, even if we were up there seeing it, it's down here, right? 30 meters, uh, maybe, are we a hundred foot above? Yeah, above the bottom of the canyon? Probably, yeah. You know, so maybe it's that water that's making its way when it rains, it pours, it's getting into that zone, right? Maybe, you know, so you add up all your, your little creeks and rivers and that zone is where that water goes through. If we get the mother of all monsoons, great. That might even, you might even see that on that one. Wow, we're getting five or eight. The structure we're seeing there is spectacular. And that's what we hunt for. Very cool coming out here and yeah. being part of dust ups. Yeah, it's glad to have you guys. All right. Very glad to have you. Obviously, 320 acres, we could spend a lot of time out here. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, if there's water at camp, I mean. That's a pretty, that's a pretty good deal, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like it there because of gravity flow more. You might get a hard sure. shower, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The location of the well is excellent. And the yields look like they're going to justify the expense. Now, I've got to figure out how I'm going to pay for all this. I have some ideas, but this information is hot off the proverbial press. Mark was on my property a week and a half ago. So for me, this is the fastest that I can turn around an episode because I was really excited to share this with everybody. I'm hoping that once this well is paid for and dug, and most importantly, that I know the yield, that's when I can start to adjust the overall direction of the project, right? I'm still not going to go full speed because I have so much more to learn about the plants, but I think we can start to think about scaling larger areas when we have a dramatic increase in the amount of water available. But that's for the future. If you want to keep watching Dust Up's content, it doesn't have to stop here. Head on over to the link in the description or scan the QR code that you see on the screen. You can watch more hidden Dust Up's content right now. Thank you for watching.